I'm kind of a bit rusty because I've not done one for a few weeks. Because so, I kind of stockpiled a pile of them and then. Uh, I think it'll be a mutually rusty one. This is, this is my first interview in a very long time. Ah, uh, we'll we'll model through, John. We'll, okay. <laughs> we'll prop each other up like you know, like we'll wounded comrades on the battlefield. We'll start we'll right. through the through the. We'll laugh about it when we're back home. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode, ah uh, shit, I knew this a second ago, episode 48 of Future Library. Uh, I'm your host, Alex Barton. I've, I've done that in a couple of episodes in a row now. That's sounding quite professional, isn't it, listeners? And uh, my guest today, he said, and I've done that as well, I've not gone this week, I've got a guest. I've actually just gone straight, I'm feeling quite proud of myself now that I've actually got this right. Okay. Uh, my guest today is uh, somebody who's been on the show before. Um, yes, you may be thinking that I'm running out of guests and I'm starting to recycle, but no, the people I speak to are creative and they come up with new things. So in your face, listeners who are thinking that. Uh, episode 9 uh, was called Anyone Can Play Guitar, and we were talking to John Spira about his movie Anyone Can Play Guitar. Uh, today's episode really should be uh, spiritually episode 76 because today we're talking to John Spira about his movie Elstree 76 John how the hell are you? <laughs> hey Alex I'm really good excellent news uh, <clears throat> we were just saying before we started recording listeners that uh, I haven't done one of these for a few weeks because I built a big stockpile of them and I've now got to the point where my back's against the wall and I've got to do some because I've run out uh, you know, it's so easy to build a big pile up and then just kind of go, yeah, I'm not going to do anything for a while. If only work were like that. Um, and so I haven't done any of these, so I'm a little bit kind of rusty around the edges. Uh, and John was saying that he's not done any interviews for a while. So we're going to muddle through. We're going to see yeah. how it goes. Okay. Uh, so, John, last time we spoke, uh, you had uh, released the excellent Anyone Can Play Guitar, which I subsequently watched when you um, sent over the DVD. Excellent movie. Cool. Very much enjoyed it. The sound was far better than you said it was. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's only got bad sound in kind of one part, really, but it, it sticks out to me. Uh, which part was it, though, that was the part that... Annoyingly, it's, it's, uh, it's in one of the Radiohead interviews. Ah. Uh, and it was what he... What actually happened was the mic dropped out, and we had two mics. We had a camera mic, and we had a, a, a lapel mic on him. Mm. And the lapel, lapel mic dropped out, and we didn't know oh. uh, until we got back. Uh, and well, I think we we paused filming for a little bit and we realised, but it was such a crucial thing that he was saying that I couldn't cut it out of the film. So we actually ended up hiring the people who um, the people who won the Oscar for the King's Speech did the sound on that, <laughs> and even they couldn't really save it. But I like it. That film's really uh that film's got a real kind of scrappiness to it, which I really like. And it was kind of it's a very honest scrappiness. And, uh, yeah, it's a very very good movie. I felt it really successfully. Uh, I kind of, I'm trying to think of how to, I'm struggling to come up with words this afternoon. It successfully paints a picture, cliche, of a uh, local music scene and how that music scene kind of became a national thing and then kind of dropped back down into being a local scene. But it kind of like, it seemed to me like it almost kind of went up a beach like a wave, left <laughs> some bands at the top of the beach and then slipped back down again. Well, you know, the funny thing about it is, is there were actually continual waves. And I think yes. the film kind of, kind of shows that. And it, and it keeps on going. I mean, I think, I think Oxford's building up to something again at the moment. Um, I, I don't feel as much part of the scene as I used to. When I was making the film, I was really, really a part of that scene. Uh, cause I was living on the Cowley Road and, and I was socializing with all the bands and, and making videos for the bands and filming the gigs. But, you know, that's going back kind of six years ago, pretty much now. Um, and so a whole, a whole new era has come into Oxford music, which is very much as good. Uh, but you know, I, I don't feel quite as much a part of it anymore. I think, I think your relationship with Oxford sounds a little bit like my relationship with Dundee, that, uh, listeners, uh, have, have heard a lot about me talking about Dundee and I just bang on and on and on about it, uh, because I was, you know, knee deep in a music scene there that I thought was fantastic. And it's, it's hard to kind of let that, that enthusiasm for something ever drop away, I oh, think. Yeah. And I will still be telling people in 20 years' time how good the Dundee music scene was at the at the turn of the century. 
<laughs> yeah, I think I think it's like anything. If you if you if you get to the point where you become evangelical about something, it's very hard to let that go. Um, but Ox is funny. The the way Ox kind of work the music scene works is is that it kind of works in generations anyway, and and people never really leave it. You know, mm. it's it's. I guess a lot of the bands who I was friends with now, um, they play a lot less, or they play in different bands, and they've all kind of grown up a bit. They, you know, they've got proper jobs and stuff, so they're most of them aren't music isn't their their main focus anymore. But you still see them at gigs when there's when there's a key. There was a gig in Oxford a couple of months ago, uh, and it was Spring Offensive, who are just amazing. I mean, like if you check out one band this year, it's Spring Offensive. Their album is is I can't stop listening to it. It's incredible. And I went to that. They had a hometown gig, uh, and I went to that, and everyone was there. I mean, really, everyone I know from Oxford Music was in that room because when something like that exciting happens, the whole scene turns out. Mm-hmm. So it was just, yeah, that was that was a gig of the year so far. Well, it's things like that. It's, I, I think it's similar to the, the Dundee thing, and I'll, I will stop talking about Dundee in a moment, uh, but not quite yet. Uh, it, it is the same kind of thing that you can get the certain people can move away and go off to do other things, uh, whilst new people come along, and some people who kind of bridged the two kind of generations are there and kind of connect them. So some of the young people who were in bands at the tail end of one bit. I kind of still in bands and seen as the kind of elder statesman of the scene by the next lot. So there's this, there's this unbroken line of, of baton passing. That's, I, I, I believe that's how it works in culture at its best. Yes. You know, living inspiration that just doesn't stop. It just, it just forms into kind of generations. So yeah, that's, it's a, a very special thing to be a part of. And the way you worded that neatly ties into the new movie because that is, uh, culture at its best is something that has affected pretty much anybody who's kind of alive in the western world and has you know been paying some kind of attention to what's going on will be aware of star wars yes uh, so. it is a cultural phenomenon uh, even even the awful prequels uh <laughs> couldn't tarnish the original you know it's i think george lucas didn't manage to do what peter jackson has done with the Hobbit tarnishing Lord of the Rings retrospectively, you know, do, you think, do you think that's true? I, d- I feel like it is. I can't. I, I mean, I I said this. I, I, I oh, few, it's just you. This is this, not. it is just me. But I did say this to uh, the actor who went under the character title of Lake Towner Uncredited in episode <laughs> thirty, uh, a guy called Chris Winchester. Uh, <laughs> who uh i did say this to him i I kind of think i was so offended by the hobbit movies that they've retrospectively ruined the lord of the rings movies for me and i'm kind of worried that the last one might be so bad it might actually start to ruin the books for me well just don't watch it i mean i I watched that's too easy (laughs) i watched the first hobbit film i didn't like it so i haven't really bothered with with the next one the next one's a better movie but it's a worse hobbit I don't, yeah, I just, it doesn't really do much for me, to be honest. No, no. But Star Wars, so they, even, yeah. even with, with prequels that couldn't tarnish it, the original Star Wars trilogy stands as a monument to to the 70s and 80s. And LG 76, well, tell us a bit about what it is, rather than me just rambling on about it. <laughs> uh, LG 1976 is, is my new documentary, uh, and it's... It's not really about Star Wars. Star Wars is 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 kind of the the hook that the whole film is is hung off. Um, I guess the best way to explain it is, is to kind of tell you how I got into it and how how the idea kind of came to me, which is that I was teaching screenwriting in Oxford at this non profit workshop, um, which was a really a really fun course, and it was quite a long course. It, the course would last kind of it was an evening course that would last twenty two weeks. So you got to know the people on the course and, you, you know, everyone socialised and went to the pub after after the classes. And there was this one guy on one of my courses, this kind of older guy, John Chapman, a really lovely guy, kind of a kind of impish, funny, funny guy. And one day he just kind of said, hey, John, you like, you like Star Wars, don't you? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I like Star Wars um, as much as the next guy, I guess. And he was like, I was in it. And... I was kind of like, what do you mean you're in it? And and he had been an X-Wing pilot in in the first Star Wars film. Uh, and that kind of blew my mind a bit. 
I've got a weird relationship with Star Wars. I think everyone's got a weird relationship with Star Wars because it's not... It almost feels like you form your relationship with Star Wars when you're so young that it's above being a film and it's above kind of criticism in a lot of ways. It's it's It, it becomes... I think I recently described Star Wars as being like baked beans in the colour brown. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like, it's, 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 I, and I fully agree with you because it's something that... You know, I was born in 1972, so it came out when I was five. Yeah. Uh, so, to my kind of conscious mind, there's never been a world in which Star Wars hasn't existed. Uh, but, it, but it also, it's not just, I think for our generation, I mean, I'm, I'm four years younger than you, but for our generation, and maybe subsequent ones, I don't know how people relate to it, it, it it's not just a film, because, no, I mean, no. you know, we were before video, I mean... We really were before videos. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, you saw the thing in the cinema, maybe. I mean, I had Star Wars toys and Star Wars was in my life before I'd seen the film. Yeah. And then you'd see them in the cinema and that would be it for quite a long time. Um, and so Star Wars was something very different. And, and it means a lot to our generation in, in not as a film, I think. That's my, my kind of my view on this is it's like a comfort food. It's like a substance. And I think... Star Wars becomes kind of very much a touchstone for your childhood, and it just makes you feel good. Seeing the iconography of Star Wars makes you feel good, and seeing images from it makes you kind of feel good. So I think our generation has a strange relationship with it. I, and I think that's different to subsequent generations where you could actually watch the films, mm. and maybe they engage with it on that level more. But, yeah, so so he told me about this, and he told me he was in Star Wars, and um, that was intriguing. And, and then he... Uh, He's so funny. I mean, I'm still friends with John. He's he's just amazing. And um, and he said, here, come to my car. He took me out to the car park and he pops his boot open and it's full of like eight by ten photos of himself. <laughs> different ones, like black and white ones and colour ones and, and, and there was an artist's impression of him in x men uniform. <laughs> and he pulls out this one photo and it was um and it was amazing. And it was a photo taken on the set of Star Wars. Um, by the official stills photographer, and it's the briefing room scene before they all go off into their X-Wings to destroy the Death Star. Mm -hmm. And it's that scene, so we all know that scene where all the X-Wing pilots are sat around talking. And it's this amazing photo, because John is front and centre in his photo. Like, the camera the camera is focused on him, and the rest of, of everything else is kind of, you know, out of focus behind him. And you can see the whole cast of Star Wars behind him. You can see Chewbacca and the droids and Harrison Ford and Mark Hamill. And it's John. And I was just like, oh, my. I mean, it just blew my mind seeing this, you know. <laughs> and meeting him and just kind of being like, wow, so you're in that. And and that night, he was hilarious. He, he took the photo. He gave, gave me the photo. He took it back off me and then hands it back to me signed, you know. <laughs> so like, carries his, his Sharpie around with him, his silver Sharpie. And, um. I came, I came home and I stuck the DVD on. I was like, I want to see him. And in the actual scene, you can just see the back of his head because <laughs> it's shot from the other angle. Oh, no. And, and that's kind of it. And that's what you can see in it. So that was, although to me that didn't really deaden it, I was so impressed to see the back of his head in Star Wars because Star Wars is above everything. Star mm. Wars is this, this kind of crazy cultural touchstone, you know, forever. So, so to be a part of that is a massive thing. But I got to know him a bit better, and uh, and he did all the conventions, all the science fiction conventions, and I'd kind of visit him at those, and um, it was just interesting. I just saw that Star Wars had had Star Wars had taken on a meaning in his life, um, which it was hard to quantify. It's still kind of hard to quantify because I, I I certainly wouldn't say that he bases his life on it or anything like that. But it's a, it's a big component part of his life. And when you think that that comes from having spent, I don't know, a couple of days on a film set in 1976. And you know, the sum total of that within the film is the back of your head in one, <laughs> one shot for 40 years later, for that to be such a component part of his life was interesting. And when I went to these conventions, there were lots of people like him, you know, there were, there were these people who, who tables and tables of people who were in Star Wars. And you did, because you grew up with that iconography, you recognised these characters. You know, you really did. You, you'd you'd see some old bloke sat at a table reading a newspaper and you'd be like, I wonder who he is. And there'd be a picture behind him. And you'd go, oh my God, he was that dude in the cantina scene, you know, who I'm so familiar with that image. And yeah, the idea just kind of formed from there. I just, I, it was interesting seeing all these people in these conventions in because it was filmed in the UK and, and a lot of these people were British or if they're American, they were expats. 
So they're all still in the UK. And it just, it just struck me as really interesting. And then it tied in really heavily with anyone can play guitar because a lot of the point, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in pop culture generally. That's, you know, that, that, that's what interests me. Um, but I hate most documentaries about pop culture because they're very straightforward and they just tell the bland story overall of a phenomenon, you know, and it's usually a story we all know. So I'm always interested in other angles. And with anyone can play guitar, I knew that the hook was going to be that here's a film which has got Radiohead and Supergrass and Ride and Foles talking about their origins. But I used that as, you know, the sugar cube for the polio ointment. <laughs> <laughs> because what I really wanted to say with that film was, yeah, well, it's nice that you love Radiohead and Radiohead are a great band, but the best bands in the world are bands you've never heard of because they didn't get signed. And, you know, that was a way I could get that through. So anyone can play guitar. That's the point of anyone can play guitar. It's saying it's more interesting. What's going on in the background is far more interesting than, than the often told stories that are going on in the foreground. Well, I think it's interesting. So, I mean, I, I'm, the thing I took away from uh, anyone can play guitar is, and I'm hoping I'm going to remember the band name correctly because otherwise I'm going to look like a complete tit right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Was it the Candy Skins? Yeah, yeah. The candy it skins. seems to me that the movie is kind of the story of the Candy Skins. That's, they form they form the spine of it. Yeah, yeah. They're kind of the, they're the tent pegs that hold the whole thing down. Yeah. So so your chance meeting with I'm going to, I'm going to show a bit of knowledge here with Red Twelve standing by. Red Twelve, uh, and he's actually he's got a whole name like because fan fiction has happened. Yes. And, uh, and he's called Drifter. Drifter. Which always reminds me of the chocolate bar, but I haven't. Said <laughs> it's a bit better than uh, Lake Town Lake Town uncredited. It's true. Uh, it's true. You see, Although, is... When you said that, it struck me that that would have been a great title for the film, just to have called the film Uncredited. Oh, oh, <laughs> too late to change it? Uh, I like L Street 96. It L is very good, L Street 76. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, those kind of combination of numbers together. And in fact, the whole thing is a, it's a better title. Than yeah, it's very satisfying. So, yes. But it would have, been, would have been funny. But yeah, anyway, sorry. But it looked good on T-shirts, L Street 70, 76. Yeah, we're talking about getting those kind of baseball shirt type things made yeah. up. That kind of 70s font. Exactly, yeah, yeah, with the, those kind of three-quarter length sleeve things. Fantastic, yeah, yeah that would look amazing. So so this spun off in your head, this idea of of these people who were kind of integral to the film, but are they peripherals to the film? Yeah, definitely peripheral. I mean, that's what interests me, is, 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 is looking at, from a very different angle. And I was thinking about this recently, because, um, because all... I'm working on another documentary as well, which is kind of on hold until L Street's edited. Um, but it's kind of all about all the films I've made so far have been about people who have been marginalized somehow by pop culture. Um, and, and it's, it, it just, it's just interesting to me. And I think it's I, like, when I think about it, I think it's because I've, I've been around people who have got famous in my life. Like there have been kind of three people I'd say at this point, others more tangential, to Lee. but there have been three people who I've been around as they got famous and that was always really interesting to me and I was always aware of the stories that were going on in the background there and I was always aware that, that those people were often surrounded by people who who I wouldn't say are more interesting like it's, it's mean to say more interesting as in like they're more interesting people but the stories are far more interesting you know mm -hmm. and um, so I think that's where that kind of comes from and that that stays with me I'm, I'm very much interested in the people i'm interested in pop culture but i'm interested in 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 the, a very different perspective on it than, than gets presented so so where did your uh investigations take you next <laughs> uh well kind of all over the place it was it was funny because we we were we were shooting a different documentary at the time we were shooting my, the follow-up to anyone could play guitar is called funny bone uh, and it's about what happened in the 1980s with comedy, uh, when alternative comedy came in and kind of knocked all of those old northern comedians. They were, Overnight, they kind of became dinosaurs and misogynists and all that kind of thing. And that really interested me, that the idea of the birth of political correctness and the idea that political correctness has kind of now done a loop. So you've got you've got a lot of really tasteless stuff on TV again, you know, but it's all under the cover of irony. And I was trying to wonder where that kind of came from. So we've been filming that. And we'd been filming that for, for a good few months and we'd decided to get all of the old, old Northern guys first because we thought they'd be harder to, to get hold of. And we spent a really great summer 
up north just just interviewing those guys did the best interview with Roy Chubby Brown we spent a bunch of time with him um, really fascinating stuff and then we came down south again to, to interview the alternative guys and Alexi Sale was the only person who'd give us an interview um, so it kind of stalled the project kind of stalled and um, we had such a good crew and we were in such a good state of motivation that my producer Hank just said look that Star Wars idea you've had, let's just go with it. Let's just start. Let's just jump straight into it. And it was it was quite liberating to do it like that, really. And we did. And and the interesting thing about that was that aside from John, I didn't I didn't know any of the people we interviewed. And the criteria that I put down was that they had to be in the first Star Wars film, and their character had to ha- they had to have their faces obscured by masks or helmets. Nice. Um, yeah, I thought that was important. I don't quite know why that was important, but it felt important. Um, and the film was going to be called Masks and Helmets originally. So, I, so that was the criteria. And basically, Hank just went off and found these people, and and you know he'd kind of say, okay, I found this person, and they played this role, and I. I'd, I'd, just say, okay, let's go and interview them. And I didn't research it um, because I I really wanted to come to those interviews completely clean, like the audience would, and just find out who these people are and who they were. And it was such a great process. It, it was really amazing. Well, it's one of those things that I think, you know, kids watching it now will be probably completely unaware that David Prowse isn't the person doing the voice of Darth Vader. Yeah. They won't even know who Dave Prowse is. They'll be I know. Like, they didn't drop the Green Cross Code Man. Yeah. They'll be like that. I mean, and I, I showed my wife the, the footage that is kicking around online uh, of some of the Darth Vader footage where it's still got the David Prowse <laughs> uh, vocal track on it. Yeah. And the whole kind of tear the ship apart. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, there's one where he's like, you're part of the Rebel Alliance and a spy. Yes. And it's, it's such a fantastic film. It, it almost feels like they should have left it in like that. But I think Darth Vader would have been slightly less menacing. Yeah, it's I, it's, it's it's really kind of bizarre. Like Dave's Dave's a very interesting guy. His interview was fascinating. Oh, so you uh, did get him excellent. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We got Dave. Uh, we went to Dave's house, which was which was very exciting. Um, and I think this, this is the thing though that's really interesting about the whole thing with Star Wars. It's not necessarily just the kind of side characters you know Darth Vader is you know yep. he's the main well, character throughout well, the whole thing I would argue that he's the most iconic villain in cinema history yes I would definitely say that you know yeah. and it, it is bizarre that Dave you know Dave Dave's just Dave and he lives in Croydon you know <laughs> and, and, and he's a family man and and I mean Dave's got a, a strong history in film anyway he's, he's played a lot of interesting characters but because he's big you know I mean it's it's he says himself it's not down to his acting uh it's, it was down to his size he was just a massive guy he was a you know a championship weightlifter yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I see my memory of him like you said before was the green cross, cross code man yeah and that's what I grew up with him being on the telly and you know, he dubbed in that as well <laughs> <laughs> was he yeah Poor Dave, yeah. Can't catch a break. I, yeah. The thing is, have you dubbed him in yours? No, we're gonna, we, we'll stick with original Dave. We'll give him his due in this one. <laughs> he's, he's a really interesting guy. He's, he's led quite quite the life, you know. Um, so it, that, was, that was a good interview. And especially, I mean, you know, the other thing about this film is it's not... It's about their lives. It's not about Star Wars as mm-hmm. such. And I made that very clear from going into it. And for some of them, that was a bit strange because for some of them, they, you know, I mean, I think all of them do the, the autograph circuit. So they've all been interviewed at some point, you know, for websites or whatever. But they're certainly not used to talking kind of about their lives and about themselves personally. So for some of them, that was a bit confusing. But we got there. You know, we, we kind of broke through with that stuff. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was definitely, Interesting. So, some of the people you spoke to then. So, it's time to drop names, John. <laughs> well, they're not really. The <laughs> problem was it's not dropping names. I mean, Dave was the big one. Also, we interviewed um, Jeremy Bullock, who played Boba Fett, um, who technically broke our rules because he wasn't in Star Wars. Um, but we we met him at a convention, and Hank, producer Hank talked to him for an hour about cricket they really got on <laughs> and Hank was like he's such a nice guy we should definitely interview him and I just thought yeah we should just because 
you know, I think when you lay a rule down for yourself, you're duty bound to break and it. Also, it's Boba anyway. Fett. <laughs> exactly, you can't turn that down. And he's such a nice guy. He's a fascinating guy, Jeremy. He was um, he was a child actor, mm-hmm. so he's acted his entire life. And he was in this film called Spare the Rod, and it is this forgotten film which after he told me about it, I hunted it down and it's, it quickly became one of my favorite films. And this was a film made in, I, mean, I think it was about 1960. And this film is like a precursor to scum. It's about a, a kind of inner city school where all kind of order breaks down. And Donald Pleasance plays the headmaster, Max Bygraves in one of his few kind of dramatic roles. And he's amazing in it, plays this teacher who comes into the school and refuses to beat the children. And, and is trying to find another way to them. And the main kid in it is played by Richard O'Sullivan, weirdly. And this film's incredible. And it's completely forgotten about this. So it's, it's hard to get hold of a copy of it. And it should be a classic. And then weirdly, a couple of months later, I bought the Morrissey autobiography and he talks about it in his autobiography. <laughs> oh, so tough. But Jeremy was in that. Jeremy was the bad kid in that. And he was in Billy Bunter. He was one of the kids on the bus in Summer Holiday. He was in those Billy Fury rock and roll movies. He was the he was Billy Fury's drummer in that, and he's never kind of stopped. So he's kind of you know he's been he's been kind of in the industry the whole way through. So he was a great interview, and he really he was interesting just talking about the kind of craft of acting as well. And it's funny with Boba Fett because you know you you look at Boba Fett's such a bizarre phenomenon because he's he's in the film for like how I mean you know how his total involvement in the Star Wars films is probably about three minutes. Yeah, he has he has a a, a completely ignominious death kind yeah. of death because they're going to bring him back in the extended stuff. Uh, he yeah he doesn't even go out with a bang. He has about three lines, I think, if that's it. You yeah, know. it's uh, really bizarre. But but the, you know the character is huge, and Jeremy's. I mean, Jeremy is one of the people whose life now basically is is Star Wars because he travels the world constantly and he makes good living signing autographs you know him and dave are the two biggest really regular signers and uh they just travel the world you know they're, they're in constant demand and yeah it's it's kind of interesting so so he's he was the other big one in terms of kind of characters they were the big two characters and he's been he's and it's for the sake of some of the listeners that might not know this i think am i right in thinking that in the original versions of the trilogy he was the voice of Boba Fett. Yeah, yeah. And then he's been retrospectively Darth Vader. Oh, really? The remix, they've replaced him. They've replaced his voice with the oh, voice the of the guy. guy. Yeah, with the voice of the guy who played Jango Fett in the prequels. Oh, of course. Oh, that's a shame. I think it's a real pity because it's like, I, I was watching a video on, on YouTube that was talking about this kind of thing. And it was saying that, you know, George Lucas is gradually changing these movies. And that really they should just be left alone. It's that unfortunately for a whole generation of kids coming up, eventually at some point it'll be forgotten that these people were the original voices and I don't think, actors. I, I think I think what you're going to find very soon, like just before they release the uh, these new films, I think now Disney have, have got the stuff and Lucas isn't involved in that way. I think they're going to remaster and re-release the original Star Wars films as they were. Do you think Disney have got a, a, a stronger hand on the tiller? these things well yeah definitely and also it's a commercial thing think about how much money they'd make if they made the original versions available it's absolutely true and it's and it's a money machine so there's no way they're not going to do it you know it's only lucas was stopping that i mean you know you know steven spielberg did a special edition of et and then when it came out on blu-ray and the dvd re-release recently he scrapped the special edition he was just like you know what you know, that was a mistake. Let's just release the original one again. So did the, the FBI agents had guns again instead of walkie talkies? Oh, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Well, so, I think, I think who was it that made the, was it, I'm trying to think who it was that made the joke about, uh, I think it might have been Time Trumpet, like the Armando Iannucci thing, right. talking about the future and saying that George Lucas had refused to die until the technology caught up with what he wanted his, his funeral to look like. <laughs> oh, it was so depressing when those films came out. It was so, there's a great, um, one of my favourite podcasts is is when Richard Herring interviewed in his Leicester Square Theatre when he interviewed Peter Serafinovich. It's fantastic. Oh, yes. Oh, I just, for me, that's like one of the definitive texts about Star Wars. I just I just adore that. That podcast is so funny. I think. So, yeah, it's it's you know the special editions they did their damage and and the prequel the the prequel trilogy did its damage I suppose but like I say Star Wars is is 
is above all of that, really. And, yeah. you know, I'm interested to see what they do with these new films. I think, I don't think they, I don't hold out a lot of hope, but at the same time, I'm just not emotionally invested in them. You know, I've got friends who, who love Star Wars, who, who are emotionally invested in these new films. And I, I just can't really be bothered. You know, my emotional investment is in, is in the original trilogy and what it meant to me when I was a kid. And that's kind of unassailable, really. So you're not, you're not Tim Bisley, uh, with his, his pyre of Star Wars stuff when The Phantom Menace came out. No, but I think, I think everyone's kind of done that naturally. You know, I, I kind of think that by the time you're in your, your late twenties, you don't really hold on to that stuff in in the same way. I don't know. It means different things to you. It, well, so, it's... you know, what? I mean, actually, you know, I say that, but part of the film of Elstree 1976, I really want to look at is, is what is behind fandom and, and, and why, I mean, some of these people we've interviewed, they, they, they never acted again. You know, they were just extras in that film and then they got on with their lives. And yet there is a huge amount of people who are happy to pay them £10 for their autograph. Mm-hmm. And that's interesting to me. It's interesting to me that, that, that you could go to a place and you and meet someone who, you know, who, who's an electrician or something and just be like, I want your autograph. You know, that person who, who isn't even recognisable in the film because their face is obscured or you can't even see them. But because they can prove they're on that set, there's a, there's a value to their autograph. And that interests me. Like, that level of fandom really intrigues me. Well, I think it might be that the people who do that feel that, in a way, they're kind of physically con- then connected to it. Yeah. You know, maybe across a distance of time and space in a, a long time, a long, long to, far, far away in a, in a long <laughs> time ago. Uh, I've completely screwed that up, haven't I? But, uh, yeah, but that, I think that's your credit. Yeah, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll fix that later. I'll go back and Lucas that so it sounds amazing. <laughs> Add a slightly racist overtone to it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think there's a there's that sense that they can go away and they can say, I've got something that's been touched by that person that's on that screen there. That's it. It's exactly. I mean, that's what it is. The, the, I talked to them a lot about this in the interviews. Um, and, and that's what they said. They basically said, well, you know, our job is to be an access point. These people can ask us anything, you know, about it. And, and they feel that by shaking our hand, you know, they're, they're connected to it. And yeah, I guess that's, you know, I can, I can, I can, I can see it. Yeah. Well, it becomes a story to tell, doesn't it? Because you can, you know, instead of saying I was in Star Wars, you can eventually say, I've met someone who was in Star Wars. And in a way, that becomes a story. Well, also, there is a, a lot of the, the extras sign um, posters, and, and people collect these posters, and they get you know the autographs of every single person they can who's involved with Star Wars to sign these posters. And they're incredible. When you see these posters, some of them are amazing. They'll have you know 400 signatures on these posters. Um, so a lot of the time, that's what the extras are asked to sign. So it's more about a kind of completionist thing. It becomes a hobby. And I guess I can understand that a bit more. It becomes kind of an obsession. You know, they want to complete the poster. Do you think part of that was uh, fed from, uh, because, I mean, a lot of the thing with the way that, that Star Wars was set up, obviously, was the merchandising. So, you know, collecting the figures, uh, collecting, I remember collecting the little uh, stickers for the sticker books and, you know, all these yeah. kind of things. And uh, and then I re- I remember regretfully selling all my Star Wars stuff when I was about fifteen, uh, and you know because I thought ah it's not going to be worth I anything. Think, <laughs> I think that's a common experience. I yes, think, I, think, I think that's mad. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, that's what I did, and it's it's all it all went to somebody else who I hope has has loved it and used it and hopefully hasn't sold it for a large fortune. Uh, but you know, you never know. You never know if these things are going to become worth. And then, as you get older, you then start going, "Ah, oh, you know what? I'm going to start. I'll collect those. They'll do the same." And then they don't. And you've got yeah, you of... can't get into anything with the word "collectors edition" or "limited edition." It never gets worth any money ever. No. <laughs> so there's no point. Or it all gets mass produced to such an extent that uh, it becomes worthless because everybody's got it and it's just tat everywhere. But then I suppose those were at the time they were just everywhere. Secondhand shops had them piled them. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, they're, they're a scary statistic. They're, they're actually, a film I, I, I donated to a film on Kickstarter, uh, which is about the story of the Star Wars figures. <laughs> it's called Plastic Galaxy, um, which was interesting. And uh, yeah, they made a lot of those toys, a lot of them. And they were, they were, they were, they were fun. Were. So, 
Uh, anyway, what's so? I, I know you were doing a Kickstarter for Elstree. Yeah, 76. if you if you go to Kickstarter now um, and type in Elstree nineteen seventy six, or just look up in documentaries, you'll find our campaign. And yeah, I mean the film's been shot now, so it's uh it's it's ready to go into post production, and that's why we need funding now. So we self funded the production. We did that with DVD sales. If anyone can play guitar, that funded the whole shoot. Um, and now we need the money to finish it, basically. So we've gone to Kickstarter. Uh, for people who don't know, that's a crowdfunding website, which means that you can... Well, we see it as a pre-sale, really. Um, you donate money to the film. And for donating money, you get rewards. And the rewards can be, you know, copies of the DVD or the Blu-ray. Uh, we've got Dan Mumford, who is just, you know, the greatest... He's at the forefront of, of the screen print movie poster kind of art scene, which is going on at the moment. And his stuff just sells out routinely. He did the cover for the new Wicker Man release that came out. Mm-hmm. He's just an amazing artist. And um, he's doing a special a special screen print just for us, just for the film. And you can only get it by donating through Kickstarter. So if you donate, you get you get one of those screen prints. And loads of different rewards, tickets to screenings, that kind of thing. Signed Boba Fett helmets, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, so it acts like a pre-sale. Basically, you know, you're, support, you're, you're giving us the money to get the film finished, but for that you get to see the film before anyone else and you get loads of extra stuff that no one else will ever get so yeah that's that's what we're doing at the moment yeah i mean it's the it's let's see how it's 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 doing pretty well we're yeah we're getting there we're getting there we we we, we the target we've put was thirty thousand, uh and i think we're at 23 now yeah, 23 224 at the moment yeah we're getting there uh thirty thousand is is the very cheapest that that we can make we can bring the film in on um, it's difficult with Kickstarter because it's that thing where if you don't reach your target, you get nothing. Yeah. So we're hoping that we actually go over the thirty thousand. Like every, once we get to thirty thousand, we can make the film, we can finish the film. Everything's fantastic. Uh, but if we get over it, then we can do it quicker and we can do it kind of better. You know. Mm. Um, so so we're hoping to kind of smash that target really, but we'll see what happens. But some people have put in for quite you know decent amounts here. Yeah, the one guy donated two thousand. Yeah, that was kind of incredible. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of people donate because uh, I think at the seven hundred and fifty pound mark, you get the executive producer credit on the film, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of people have donated to that. And, and that's kind of a clever thing on their part to do because seven hundred fifty quid, which isn't a lot of money in a lot of ways, they get a credit on IMDb for that. So people who are trying to kind of build a career and build a kind of you know uh, a kind of uh, a CV type thing. Mm-hmm. They can very easily just do that. That worked really well. Not anyone can play guitar, actually. Um, bizarrely, we had a cast member from Twilight as an executive producer on Anyone Can Play Guitar. Fantastic. And I, I had no direct contact with him, but I had direct contact with his PA. And he was just like, yeah, he's trying to get into, into music documentaries. He wants to make music documentaries, so he's just building up his portfolio. <laughs> Well, I'm really, I'm glad to see that it's actually sitting there at a decent amount because there's there's always the fear that you're going to click on one of these things and see that it's got 25 hours left to run, and needs to pull in um, more than it's already pulled in. Uh, so it's, it is a relief to click on it and see that it's I, actually a decent it amount. Calculated risk. I mean, like a lot of people who do crowdfunding just don't understand crowdfunding. They mm. really don't. And luckily, I've had the anyone can play guitar experience, which was actually quite early on. You know, that was. When we did the crowdfunding for that, that was still a very new thing. And I had to learn, I had to research, and I had to learn as I was going along. And a lot of people use crowdfunding in just a stupid way. They just kind of go, um, oh, I've got an idea for a film. And they literally just say, I want to make a film. I've got an idea for a film. Uh, I need an unrealistic amount of money. And the films aren't commercial, and they don't know how to market it, and they don't know how to market the, the campaign itself. And it kind of gets a bit embarrassing. And, and you know, we worked really hard on that campaign. Um so I, I I was fairly confident we were going to do okay. I mean, you never know, but I was fairly confident we were going to do okay. I mean, just based on how we did with Anyone Can Play Guitar, you know, four years ago, or how long ago that was. Um, so, yeah, it's good, but but it's weird with crowdfunding. I, I, I kind of feel like Kickstarter should should keep a tighter rein on it. Like when, when, when we did it, we did it with Indiegogo for Anyone Can Play Guitar, mm-hmm. and you had to apply to get on that site at that time. You had to, you know, they had to check the project out and see if it was appropriate. And now it feels like, you know, anyone with any idea can just start. And that's to the detriment of, of these websites because there's so much crap that people have to wade through to get to the, the projects where it's actual professional people who can deliver a product. 
Well, <laughs> looking at this on here, I mean, just looking at the Kickstarter page itself, it it looks to me it looks really good. It looks. I mean, I can. There's things I really like about the way that this is set up, like the uh, the still that it's sitting on for the uh, the video. Yeah. With the stormtrooper looking out, and I. And this is going to sound like a, a weird little detail that I really, really like. I like that the Elstree 1976 along the bottom, the white, the lettering sitting right at the bottom of the image, so it kind of bleeds down into the text below. I yeah. really like that. That was my choice. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> very, very good choice. The, well, you know, I mean, like, we, we, it took a long time to get that trailer. I mean, like, a really long time, because I knew that that was... Basically, we've made this film in secret. Because we were we were kind of worried about what Lucasfilm might might do, uh, in terms of I mean we weren't doing anything illegal, but we just thought if they get wind of it and they don't like it, they could probably threaten the interviewees. They could probably say to them, "We'll make it difficult for you, or you can't come to the big the big conventions if you take part in this film." So we we did it under secrecy, and I didn't want to break cover until we had a trailer, until we had a Kickstarter campaign. I wanted the first thing people to he- hear about the film they could actually see what it was. Because besides anything, it's quite a hard film to articulate what it is. Mm-hmm. Like, I find it difficult to explain to people what it is, but if you watch the trailer, you get it. Um, and that trailer was a nightmare to edit, you know. It's, it, I mean, there were eight separate edits on that, you know, complete re-overhauls uh, to just try and get it right. And then, you know, the whole trailer was scored. Our composer, Jamie Hyatt, you know, scored the whole trailer and I had to work with him on that. So it took a lot to get to that point. And, and I'm really happy with that trailer. But I just think if it was anything less than that, it would look like a shitty fan film. And that's what I'm constantly scared of, Mm -hmm. because it sounds like a fan film project, you know, because a lot of these shitty fan films get made. Mm -hmm. And they're people who aren't filmmakers, who just have passion. But they're the worst people to make these films. You know, it's it's making a film about something that, that, you know, you're you're a diehard fan of means can mean that you have no objectivity. Um, So it's awful. And, And before we before we actually made the film. We went on Amazon and we ordered every single Star Wars documentary you can get your hands on. And, you know, there's just such shit out there. You know, these fan films, they're just, they're embarrassing to watch. So I'm terrified of that. I hate, you know, I really hate the idea. I think um, BuzzFeed did a, did a piece on us, which was weird. And they said, and the headline was, Star Wars super fan tracks down extras. And I was like, oh, you fuckers. <laughs> what, what? That's exactly what I don't want think you know that i'm a super fan it's yeah well just just before i started speaking to you i was kind of going through a couple of websites and one of the ones i spotted there was one with a great big star wars at the top of it and uh i went through it and there was no link to the kickstarter anywhere in the story and i was like <laughs> how have they done this they've linked to loads of other things but they've not actually managed to link to the kickstarter anyway which yeah. is but yeah the thing it's interesting you were saying about the fan films because um I kind of on a an on idle afternoon recently kind of clicked on a few uh, Star Wars fan films, you know, because they promised the world with their little posters that they put at the it's, it's the image. You know, you look at it, you think could be good, and I yeah. I should have realised because I've made this mistake before with Star Trek uh, fan films, where you click on them and you go oh oh so you've bought a uniform and you've shot everything really close up so that you don't have to have any sets and. Yeah, and there are a lot of them like that. The only one I saw that seemed to be quite good, and I've actually got sitting waiting as, as a uh, watch it later, was a uh, thing about uh, kind of telling it from the point of view of stormtroopers and stuff. Oh, uh, is that troopers or troops or whatever? I'm that? not sure. Let me have a look. I'll go onto YouTube and I've got there, it. In there is a really good short film. I think it's called Troops or Troopers, and it's yeah, that's that's really funny. That's quite good now. Yeah, let's have a look. There's uh, where is it? It's going to be on here. I've got here Star Wars IMPS. Mm-hmm. And somebody has cut the whole of the, a lot of these little shorts into one thing and it runs for 41 minutes. And I can kind of skip forward through a few little bits and it actually looks really good. So I am going to watch it. And it was funny. So it's cool. I mean, like, you know, there, I'm sure there is some good stuff out there. But it's, it's not much. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, but it's nice. It's, it's, it's interesting when you talk to the interviewees about, these, about the fans. And, you know, they're so passionate and, and, and it is, you know, it's really important to them. And, and so it's kind of nice, you know, it's nice that it kind of inspires them. I think the only problem kind of comes when, when you, it's like you say, you feel kind of slightly conned into things mm-hmm. because they, you know, 
Uh, I don't know. It's fine. Let well, it <laughs> no, let's look at. Let's try and give it a positive spin for these guys. Do this. They may be making crap now, but that doesn't mean they'll be making crap later. No, that's true. And you know what? You know, it's I. I. I shouldn't say bad things because. I really believe that filmmaking should be about the experience, not about the end product. And I've told that to my students for years, and I, and I do believe that. Um, and so for them, you know, they're getting together with their friends and they're celebrating something they really love. So, you know, that's that's to be applauded. I'd yeah. probably just rather not watch them. <laughs> there you go. So if you if you don't watch them, <laughs> you can... Yeah, I, I love them. I, I love them. I love them in, you know, in concept, definitely. Well, that's a really nice way of putting it. <laughs> so, so what's the hope then next? Obviously, we're hoping you've got thirty-four days left to run to yeah. raise just over six thousand pounds. Yeah, sounds likely. I think. I hope so. Yeah, uh, you know, like I say, hopefully more. But um, yeah, I think I think we'll do okay with it. And there's been a good response. People have responded well to it, and that's that's as important as the money is. Is that people have seen the trailer and really liked it, and kind of because it's quite an emotive trailer. Um, and I, I, I have heard stories of people crying watching the trailer, which, which is weird. Um, but that's, I'm, that's the main thing I'm happy about is, is that people understand what I'm trying to do with this film and think it's a good idea. And you can't hope for more than that, can you? I don't think so. No. That's really good. So, uh, so, so assuming that in just over a month, You've got the funding, and yeah. like I say, I think it's looking pretty good. Uh, what will be the next step? Will it be then be kind of ramp up straight into kind of post production and start getting everything pulled together? Yeah, basically uh, starting the edit. Um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it's starting the edit and and going for that. It's it's um, it's a difficult juggle at the moment because I'm I'm working full time, um, but you know I can't wait to do it. I just can't wait to start cutting. So the date we've put on the project is is. December 2015 for delivery um, and that's partially because that's when the new films are coming out so we'd like to be kind of in, in the running when there's all that press about Star Wars but I think we're going to be finished before that I mean that's 18 months away mm-hmm. so my thought is that we're going to be finished before then and it's also it's a, it's a it's a simpler edit than anyone can play guitar was anyone can play guitar had, had I think we did 40 interviews you know it was we had so much footage and such a huge story to tell mm-hmm. and this is kind of very different and it's it's kind of um it's it's ten portraits really. It's just portraits of who these people are and their lives and stuff. So it's it's going to be a simpler edit and it's going to be a slightly simpler film. Um, so yeah, I think I think we'll we'll turn it around fairly quickly. That's, yeah, I I am excited to see this. <laughs> uh, so I mean, obviously the the other question is for you: what's next? Funny Bones is that still kind of stalled in? Least, I mean, yeah, I mean that we we've we've vowed to uh to to pick it up as soon as the edit's finished on L Street, and hopefully by then there'll be a, a kind of bigger profile. Also, like my, I'm working at the BFI at the moment, mm-hmm. so like that's like, and and I'm working as I'm the AV producer, so I make documentaries for the BFI and I interview the talent, and and I I'm hoping that that will put me in better stead approaching next time we approach the alternative people's management and agents and stuff. Cause I understand why, you know, certainly at that point, they don't know who we are. They've not heard of anyone can play guitar. So, you know, why would they agree to an interview? You know, what's in it for them? Uh, so we're hoping that this film and, and what I've been doing since will have, you know, upped our profile significantly enough that we can actually get some of those interviews. Yeah. It's so much like doing this podcast, really. It's kind of a case of, you know, you, you go to people and they don't have to say yes. And sometimes you luck out, and you get people who are quite high profile who do say yes. Uh, so, you know, example, I've been really pleasantly surprised when I got to speak to Throwing Muses and yeah. got to speak to Miles Hunt from The Wonder Stuff and, you know, people who'd really affected me when I was younger. And it's, it's, it's all, it's very easy to take it kind of personally when people don't reply or say no. But then, like you say, it's, you know, it's just because they don't owe us anything. Yeah. So, you know, why, why, why should, like, I understand. I mean, I'm always, pleasantly surprised when when people say yes in fact the the really weird thing about working for the bfi like the first week i was there was was i'm so used to being an independent filmmaker and having to really launch a campaign to get someone in your film of of you know (laughs) constantly kind of begging them and explaining why they should do it and that kind of thing 
And when you're at the BFI, you just phone up and say, yeah, I'm phoning from the BFI. And they, they just say, yeah, where do you want me? <laughs> it's kind of like, wow. It's so weird. You know, same person doing the interview, but it's, it's a world of difference, just those, those kind of letters. Um, but yeah, why should they, you know, why should, why should they give up their time? Why should they do that? Um, but for me, it's, it's a kind of, it's kind of a passion thing. I mean, like, you know, we, we, we tend to get the interviews because we're so passionate about what we're doing that people get that and people will eventually just kind of say, okay. I think the only problem with Funny Bone is, it's been that there's been no access point to these people beyond their manager. They have such, such big management. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know, those companies are, are massive because they also, you know, they're TV producers and stuff. Um, and whereas the old Northern guys, they tend to just have, you know, an agent, some bloke they're friends with. So you can, they will put it to them. I, my feeling with Funny Bone was that, that a lot of the people who, who said no didn't even know about the film. Mm-hmm. They just, but their, their agents just acted as a kind of buffer zone. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at all that. I think yeah, it, 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 I mean, my experience of kind of approaching kind of bigger names has been that it, I, I got used to going straight to the individuals, yeah. and then suddenly, kind of people saying, "Oh, we'll speak through this person to this person to this person." It's like well, that just seems weird to me. But you know, that's how some people do it, and you know, it they, is. It's, it's how it works. It's interesting. It's really interesting. But um, yeah, it's funny, and it's all it all becomes kind of very commodity like in that sense it's kind of like what will the interview do for them and stuff and yeah it's weird but that's you know that's the modern world isn't it it is indeed <laughs> and that seems like a, a an appropriate place to draw things to a close uh we've brought ourselves to the back to the modern world from 1976 uh go to for the listeners go to kickstarter uh, look up Elstree uh, for anybody who doesn't know how to spell that. E L S T R E E, 1976. Uh, go and watch the trailer. Read all the, the, the very a very comprehensive explanation. Uh, <laughs> a lot better, uh, as John has correctly said. A lot of people just throw out shit things that they haven't worked out. Uh, this one's properly, you know, explains exactly what's going on and why it's being done and what's being done. Uh, it's not one of these ones where it just has, you know, I've got some friends, we have a bike, we're going to make a film about my friend's bike, we want a million pounds. Uh, it's not one of those, it's actually properly done. Go and look at that, go and buy uh, Anyone Can Play Guitar, yeah. and uh, and start, I was going to say, start ringing up the agents of comedians and badgering them into, but I don't, actually I think that might be counterproductive. <laughs> okay. So let's don't do that. Right. It's what I'm saying to, to the listeners. Don't do that. Uh, John, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Yeah, thanks, Alex. That's been really cool. Uh, so, yeah, well, I guess, uh, if, if is there anywhere else that people need to go online if they want to find more out about what you do? Um, you can you can follow me on Twitter, which is at video John, J-O-N. Um, and you can follow Elstree1976, at Elstree1976. Um, I think that's probably about it, though. There's an Elstree 1976 Facebook group as well, uh, which is ace. Producer Hank is running that, and he's found incredible kind of behind-the-scenes photos from the original Star Wars films, and he's kind of regularly posting those, so that's really good fun. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's what you know. Okay. Cool. I guess all that's left to say, then, is the what has become now, after almost 50 episodes, the traditional Future Library goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you for downloading this episode of Future Library. Future Library is brought to you by PetPiranha.com and is hosted by myself, Alex Bottom. The podcast is free, but if you do want to show your appreciation, feel free to go along to alexbottom.co.uk and click through to music, uh, where you'll be able to find things that you can buy or go to a smallglassghost.co.uk where you can buy my latest music. Uh, episodes come out when I feel like it, mostly weekly. Uh, but that's it, so thank you for listening.